This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon. VD is for everybody. There are television shows out there that leave a significant impact. Sometimes an impact on pop culture, but more likely an impact for the viewer. It doesn't need a huge audience, just a dedicated audience that gravitated towards it during its run and remembers it fondly. They never forget the theme song, they can still tell you their favorite episodes even if they haven't watched the show in decades and there will always be a place to talk about it with fellow viewers. And then there are shows that aren't that. Shows that left no impact whatsoever. Shows that could have run for years, but still garnered so little interest that even with physical evidence of its existence, TV listings, commercials, full episodes, mentioning this show will give you a blank stare and a, what's that? Such is the case with today's topic, 16 Cinema. Sixteen Cinema was a show of some kind, a show that existed on Nickelodeon for multiple years during a major upswing in the channel's popularity and viewership. But virtually all the people I've talked to about it have given me that blank stare and asked, what's that? So yeah, what is Sixteen Cinema? It's just special delivery again. Yes, special delivery, Nickelodeon's junk drawer program that began in 1980 where the channel just aired whatever they could get their hands on. Specials, movies, concerts, documentaries, one or two episodes of shows that sometimes became part of Nickelodeon's regular programming, but most of the time didn't. And among all of that were after-school specials, the oft-goofed-on, high-melodrama, one-hour films that aired on afternoon network television through the 70s and 80s. Stories of teenagers dealing with big issues like peer pressure, disability, addiction, death, birth, and being your true self. And I guess Nickelodeon had managed to grab the rights to more of these than they really intended to air on special delivery. Well, we shouldn't let them go to waste, so what if we gave them their own package show on Sundays? We'll just rotate through our collection of after-school specials until we either find something better to put in that time spot or our broadcast rights expire. And let's market it directly to 16-year-olds. Let's just slap our intended demographic right there in the title. Nickelodeon knows growing up isn't always easy. Sometimes it's hard. We're a family now, and I expect us to act like a family. Sometimes it hurts. Why does she have to get better in order to die? And because there are times you need to know you're not alone, Nickelodeon presents 16 Cinema, stories about kids with hard choices about growing up. Everything's going to be all right, huh? Join us for 16 Cinema every Sunday afternoon at 5, 4 Central on Nickelodeon. 16 Cinema premiered on October 4th, 1987, with a dedicated hour-long spot on Sundays at 5 p.m., right after Mr. Wizard's World and right before Nick at Night. It would run uninterrupted in that spot for 87 weeks, its final broadcast on May 28, 1989. And in those 87 weeks, it would air only 27 unique programs, 21 of them being from the ABC After School Specials program. Of course, 27 programs aired over 87 weeks means everything's getting rerun an average of three times or so, right? Actually, it's worse than that, because of what I call the Core 13. The first 13 specials that were subsequently reran far more than the others. The Core 13 are, in the order 16 Cinema aired them, The Skating Rink, 1975. A shy boy falls in love with figure skating when a new ice rink opens in town, but his tough love farmer father disapproves. Between Two Loves, 1982. Two talented teenage violinists begin dating, but their relationship is challenged when both are nominated to compete in a prestigious music contest with a college scholarship on the line. She Drinks a Little, 1981. Teenage girl has to come to grips with her mother's crippling alcoholism as it begins to affect her day-to-day -day life, so she joins a support group. Tough Girl, 1981. 
A streetwise teenager is forced to move to her rich father's home to avoid a juvie sentence, where she meets and becomes close friends with a deaf, aspiring veterinarian. It's a mile from here to glory, 1978. A young aspiring track star has to rework his life when he's left partially disabled after getting hit by a car. A Matter of Time, 1981. A young woman has to find a way to move on with her life after her mother receives a terminal cancer diagnosis. Introducing Janet, 1981. A class clown and a waiter team up to work through their stand-up acts. This is the only one of the core 13 that isn't an ABC After School special. It's a Canadian TV movie for CBC. And yes, that is a young Jim Carrey. <laughs> <laughs> if you're curious about this one because of Jim Carrey, it's easier to find under its alternate title, Rubberface. Daddy, I'm their mama now, 1982. A 12-year-old girl has to become the parent to her two younger brothers after their mother passes away. Francesca Baby, 1976 teenage girl has to come to grips with her mother's crippling alcoholism as it begins to affect her day-to-day -day life. So she joins a support group. Hey, wait a minute. The Heartbreak Winner, One Girl's Struggle for Olympic Gold, 1980. A young aspiring figure skater has to rework her life when she's partially disabled by juvenile arthritis. Okay, ABC, you only did like six of these a year. You, you had to have had more ideas. Very Good Friends, 1977. A teenager works through the grief of the sudden accidental death of her younger sister. Dear Lovely Heart, I Am Desperate, 1976. A girl starts up an advice column for her high school newspaper. But is the advice she's giving doing more harm than good? A Special Gift, 1979. A shy boy falls in love with ballet, but his tough love farmer father disapproves. Okay, fine. I guess we've gone full circle. And that's the core 13. Each of these hour-long films aired at least four times on 16 Cinema. Most of them aired five times. New specials were added beginning in May of 1988, after two and a half cycles of the Core 13. But the new editions got far fewer repeats. Some didn't get repeated at all. While the Core 13 still made up the bulk of the broadcasts. Now, Nickelodeon rerunning a show with a low episode count into oblivion is nothing new. You might remember Kids Rights only had 17 episodes, and that show aired without interruption for six years. But with 16 Cinema, there's the added element in the lack of story variety among the episodes. Two stories about alcoholic mothers, two stories about figure skaters, two stories about boys participating in sports that their conservative fathers think aren't manly enough, three stories about coping with deaths in the family. The additional specials later on did add some variety. Here's one about sexually transmitted diseases. Here's one about hit and runs. And here's one about racism. It's Joel's first day at Nichols Junior High School. Let's all welcome him. What is the color of friendship? Sunday on 16 Cinema. But compressing years of after school special history into this show really demonstrates how they weren't really designed to be watched as a show. Initially, the after school specials aired, well, whenever, with only five to seven new additions being made every year. Without a heavy syndication presence and preceding home video, patterns like these reoccurring plot elements are more easily obscured. So grouping these specials as a weekly program really drives home how manufactured they can feel. This just wasn't the intended form factor for these things. Today, the after-school special is a bit of a punchline up there with Lifetime movies and very special episodes. You know, for being a bit cheesy, a bit maudlin, and a bit preachy. And some of them are just not very good. Tough Girl is probably my least favorite of the specials I managed to watch for this. It's without focus. At first you think it's going to be about this tough street girl, Renee, developing her relationship with her rich, estranged father. But the father character completely disappears around the 13 minute mark. We never see him again. Then you think it's going to be about the rivalry between Renee and her snotty new stepsister, complete with a stealing boyfriend subplot. But the stepsister also disappears after around a half hour. And then there's the budding friendship and the will-they-won't-they they romance with the deaf vet student. But that ends with a fight that they might be able to patch up. But then the special just ends. 
with Renee alone on a dirt road. Three plot threads left unresolved, and I just don't know what the message here is. With all that said, I don't want to be too unfair to the After School Special. They do have their own strengths and unique qualities. The ABC After School Specials began in 1972, a time when television specifically for a young teenage audience was pretty slim pickings. You had um, American Bandstand and maybe a sitcom here or there, but for the 11 to 14 crowd, who were too old for cartoons and too young for prime time, that was pretty much it. Dramatic television for teenagers about teenage characters was a brand new concept. ABC was breaking new ground. The goal of the ABC After School Specials is to employ high-style drama, comedy, and animation, deliberately steering away from documentary techniques, which have proven neither successful as an attraction for children, nor effective in getting our message across. Our prime target audience is the often neglected, usually fickle, but extremely important kids 8 to 14 years old. Telecast but twice a month at a highly competitive time in the afternoon, it is imperative that they are compelling enough to capture and retain that audience's attention, while presenting a rewarding, explicit bottom line. While motivated in being somewhat educational, the specials also needed to be engaging drama so that teenagers, you know, those older kids who are usually busy with school, would want to watch it. The after school special was the petri dish from which a lot of teen drama tropes would grow. Student cliques, dating troubles, temptations of drugs, underage drinking, and premarital sex, school sports being made out to be way more important than they actually are. More than that though, these are stories about young adults finding agency over their lives. The problems faced here are often serious, and it's up to the teenage characters to make the right decisions. Adults in these after-school specials are either the source of the problem, or they're barely around at all. They might swing in with a hug and maybe a tiny bit of advice for one scene, but they don't offer a solution. The young protagonists have to figure it out themselves. In many ways, the after-school special was the ancestor of all the teen dramas we've enjoyed over the years, from Degrassi to Pretty Little Liars, from Beverly Hills 90210 to Riverdale. There's a little bit of after-school special DNA in all of them, either as an evolution of these tropes or as a response to them. Producer Josh Schwartz created the OC as a sort of intentional opposition to what those specials stood for. Your mother has a drinking problem. She needs help. There's a doctor coming here this afternoon. He's gonna help us stage an intervention. What? What? This is like an after-school special? It had to happen that way, says OC creator Josh Schwartz, 29, who grew up watching late-era after-school specials and intended his own show to be quite different. The first sort of amoral teen drama. Here, alas, was a completely moral moment. The characters were doing the tough, right thing. So Schwartz mocked the Enterprise, the best way he knew how. Whenever you feel like you're crossing that line into teaching, the cheap way out is just to call attention to it, which we employ time and time again, Schwartz said. I'm not knocking after-school specials. They were put on Earth for a different purpose than the OC. However, while this makes me appreciate the after-school special more as an amateur media historian, it doesn't mean that 15 years after its conception, rerunning a small number of these older specials every Sunday for nearly two years made for great cable television. As the occasional one-off on special delivery, the people interested in these little films could enjoy them, and those who weren't interested could just wait for the next special delivery, which might have been a concert or a cartoon or, heck, a few episodes of the Kids of Degrassi Street, a more modern conception of these stories. But 16 Cinema offered no such variety, not even significant variety within the after-school special limitation itself, and for that, it's largely faded into obscurity. One of the things we like to do here on Knickknacks is properly demystify the stories around Nickelodeon's history, presenting a much more complicated picture than most people believe. 
We like to pretend that, when Jerry Laybourne took over the channel after Cy Schneider's departure, it was like a switch being flipped, with Nickelodeon going from a cruddy green vegetable channel to a fun playhouse that everyone loved. But that's simply not the case. While Laybourne's tenure would result in a lot of decisions that would bring Nickelodeon away from the brink of failure, it was a much more gradual, granial process. The channel's long-term success just wasn't guaranteed until the surprise ratings bonanza of Double Dare in 1986, and even here in 1987, into Laybourne's fourth year in charge of the channel. Programming was still being chosen that reflected the old Schneider-era green vegetable sensibilities. The idea of what Nickelodeon should be was still evolving, and just because it had the orange splat logo and animated programming didn't mean it had fully shaken off its older form. I'm old enough to have grown up with the 90s era of the ABC After School specials, and they never grabbed me as a youth, as even in the late 80s the model of teen drama was rapidly outpacing the specials in terms of entertainment value and memorability. But after school specials weren't automatically bad. Some of them were well put together and very well acted. I don't want to come off as too dire here. 16 Cinema wasn't some great sin against Nickelodeon. It was fine. It's only through repetition that it starts to get tedious. And besides, it was Sunday afternoon. Nothing good has ever been on on Sunday afternoons. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Next time. All right, kids, are you ready to exercise with Scott Bale? That's, um, that's it. That's all this is. Today's research shout out goes to TV and Teens Experts Look at the Issues, edited by Meg Schwarz. This 1982 book of essays breaking down the development of television aimed at a teenage audience, primarily through the 70s, includes a nice chapter on the after-school specials, including excerpts from the ABC after-school special Writer's Guideline that I quoted earlier. I'm glad to have found it, but I'm surprised there doesn't seem to be an actual dedicated book about the after-school special. It was such a major part of television history, and it seems to have gone mostly unexplored from a media history and analysis standpoint. Thank you all for watching. If you'd like support Knickknacks and other Paparina projects, consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar goes to production values, research materials, and cheap chicken wings. You can also support Paparina by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing to the channel, hitting that bell icon for notifications, following me on Twitter, sending a one-time donation through PayPal or Coffee, and sharing knickknacks with all your friends. Take care, viewers, and remember, Black Lives Matter. <laughs>